Okay, so we are recording now. So good evening, everyone. This is the Amherst Conservation Commission, and today is October 14th, 2020. Um, so starting off with comments for me, I just have one question for you, Dave, or one uh, heads up. I don't know if you know the, I'll just call it the little shack that is kind of behind Haskins Meadow. Uh, the shack, the shack out in the woods, you mean? Yeah, it's kind of like an old well or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so one of the sides has fallen down and it's filled with water and it's kind of dangerous. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I, ha I have not been out there since we bought it. Um, so I will take a look at that. Um, I can't yeah, is, it kind of a, is it is it a couple feet deep, Brad, or I can't recall how deep? Uh, I put in a big stick and I didn't find the bottom. You didn't find the bottom, okay. So it could have been that was just really mushy though too. I didn't dig around too. So much. you're worried you're worried about kids if a kid fell in there or something like that. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And it looks like there was a there were four walls and somebody boarded it up at one point, but one of the walls has fallen down at this point. I don't know if that's recent or not. Yeah, it's so. kind of a mystery, uh, kind of a mystery shack out there. I wonder if it was part of a, a well or something. Yeah, it's definitely kind of strange. Yeah, we will uh, figure that out. Okay, thank you, Dave. So just a heads up on that. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's it for me. So, um, Aaron, did you want to go or do you want to, or I'm sorry, I guess Dave, did you want to go? No. Yeah, I, I know you've got a big agenda tonight, and I actually can't be with you the whole night, but I'll be very brief. Just a couple of updates around around town. Um, I know that Brad is coordinating with the folks at Coles to install the story walk that you all approved up at the Lower Mill River. Um, I did see the um, I did see the prototype, and they look really nice. They're going to be very simple. Very nicely done, um, you know, pressure treated poles with very nice um, uh, display for the pages of, of the books. So I know that they're trying to coordinate that now. Um, is that me feeding back or no? That was a dog, Dave. Oh, that was a dog. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, Bluebird Meadow, we're on the theme of signs. So we are coordinating with Carol Gray. We do have her signs for Bluebird Meadow. This is the conservation area off of Southeast Street, uh, right before the underpass, the Southern underpass. And um, we just gotta find some time to get in there and uh, place those signs. Um, we, did, we did close with the Allison's and the Kestrel Trust on that seven acres gift that you all approved a couple of weeks ago. So we are the proud owners of seven acres of additional conservation land up on the Mount Holyoke Range. That's right off of Bay Road at Sweet Alice. That'll essentially just be added to the Sweet Alice conservation um, area. You may have you may have read associated with that. You may have read in the newspaper that Kestrel um, has committed to putting their offices at the Epstein House. So that's really exciting. That was always the vision. They were exploring the financial and and other feasibility of that project. So. The good news is they are moving ahead with a modest renovation of that uh, 1960s house. And um, I think they hope to be in there in the spring. So it'll be nice to have a presence on the range. Um, they can help us with programming and uh, bringing more people to explore the Mount Holyoke range and, and all it has to offer. Um, yeah, Dave, well, do you know if that's going to just be a office or is it also be a visitor center or anything along those lines? Um, at this point, they don't plan it to be a visitor center. I think, you know, everybody is looking kind of down the road post-COVID. Um, I do think they will eventually run some programs out of there. They may have some workshops. Um, they certainly might, you know, you know, invite people to be there for special occasions, but I, I don't think they plan to staff it like you would say the Hitchcock Center on a weekend or, or something of that sort. The parking will be kind of limited. I think there'll be spaces for something like 11 cars, but it'll give us a presence. It'll really be a nice jump start for us to uh, connect all the trails, um, get new parking uh, or enhanced parking going. Um, 
you know, around the corner, we've talked about where we're going to have the uh, parking area off of the new subdivision road off of West Street. So um, those houses are moving along quickly. And, you know, I suspect late spring of 21, we'll get going with the trail connection there. Um, anyway, so yeah, a lot happening down there in the Mount Holyoke Grange. And then lastly, just um, a little plug for Brad and Tyler. It has been this the summer of uh, down trees, you know, all these these storms, these flashy storms, microbursts coming through North Amherst, South Amherst, Lawrence Swamp, Pulpit Hill Road. I just these guys can't get a break. And you know, even in the last five days, more trees down. We're, we're getting lots of emails, lots of calls, which are wonderful. But um, you know, some of these trees are just massive. You know, hundred foot white pines and. You know, Brad, I give credit, kudos to Brad and Tyler for, it's just the two of them now. We, all of our summer staff have left. So um, I was just, where was I? Um, boy, I'm, I'm blanking on where I was recently. And um, I guess it was in Lower Mill River and was surprised to see how many trees were down there, huge trees that they have cleared off the trail between uh, Mill River Recreation Area and Buffers Pond. Um, so, um, it's gonna, they'll be doing that into 21, into the winter, which is a great time to clear trails. But if you see things out on trails, you're dog walking, you're hiking, you're running, you're biking, uh, shoot them an email and they will add it to the list. We're gonna be doing this for probably months. Um, I will say, speaking of uh, upper, uh, Lower Mill River, just if, you know, we've gotten a fair number of calls. There is a gentleman up um, below Puffer Spawn, below the dam, who is, um, very uh, active, shall we say, in um, making carns in the brook there. And uh, we've done a little outreach to him. Um, uh, he's very energetic, shall we say, and he's made a lot of carns. And he's also made some kind of natural sculptures in the woods, um, which some people have been, you know, somewhat offended by uh, just simply the use of, of natural um, materials and, and he made a large bird nest, et cetera. So I won't go into great detail. Perhaps some of you have been down there hiking, but we are trying to, to kind of outreach to him and, and, and um, in the best way possible, really discourage him from doing that. He's moving a lot of rocks and disturbing a lot of habitat and um, it, it just needs to stop. So we'll keep an eye on that, um, but we're trying to be as um, kind of understanding as possible um with with him so yep. so you actually know who it is though dave we do yeah. yeah yeah so conversations are kind of ongoing with him so um we will we'll we'll see how that goes but if you do get reports we know about it we're on it and um we'll just try to convince him as winter approaches that um this is a, a little too much a car in here a car in there i don't have a problem but when you make 50 of them in the stream, then it really becomes something a little bit more than, um, you know, is necessary. So I think I will stop there. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much, Dave. So any questions or comments for Dave? I see Larry is talking, but I can't hear him. Larry, you're on mute. There you are. I think you're off mute. Uh, no, Larry, your audio is just not working. Larry, your audio is not working. We can't hear you even when you're off mute. Hmm. I wonder if he could call in. Nope. No. No. We can read your lips, though. <laughs> yeah, because we don't have like a chat window or anything set up. Okay, so uh, hopefully he'll have that set up in a sec. So um, we'll have that fixed. So Aaron, why don't we go over to you? So we have uh, at least 20 minutes or so before our first, or I guess 15 minutes before our first hearing. Okay, um, so the first thing, um, I mean, there's, there's uh, a bunch of other business items and I'll try to kind of sprinkle those in as we have um, breaks in the evening. Um, but I did just want to um, 
make you guys aware of the Eversource um, proposal for a mitigation on Podic conservation land that has been submitted to us in the form of a notice of intent application. This is mitigation for some wetlands work that they're doing at Podic substation. I think you guys have been briefed on this um, over the last few months several times uh, that we had been in communication with them. Um, and this was the initial design that they submitted to us. Um, and in the upper left, you can see this is the field at Podic Conservation Area. They delineated the wetlands out there and then they planned up in this upper left-hand corner, this um, wetland uh, replication area. And then within that, they planned to put two, ver to design two vernal pools. And, you know, when we had initially started conversations with them, the idea was to create vernal pools that could provide some habitat for the, um, oh my gosh, wow. Eastern Spadefoot Toad. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Eastern Spadefoot was what we were targeting. Um, and so when we got this proposal, which we got very little lead time in reviewing or giving feedback on. Basically, they presented it to me on a Friday. I told Dave about it. And then on Monday, they submitted it as part of the notice of intent. So we reached out to Jake Kubel from Natural Heritage, asked him to go out to the site, asked him for some feedback. And he's given us quite a bit of comment. I don't know. He was, um, uh, he had made arrangements to go out to the site. I don't know if he actually made it out there because I actually had to cancel um, I was supposed to meet him and I ended up having to cancel last minute um, meeting him. I don't know, Dave, if you He did able... make it out there. Yeah, he called me from the site. I was not able to join him, but he did make it out there. Oh, okay. All right. So um, I will follow up with Jake between now and the upcoming meeting on October 28th, but this is more or less just to give you a heads up that this is going to be on the agenda. There may be some um, staff recommendations based on Jake's um, comments from visiting the site. And, and also he had some just initial um, comments based on the design for how to improve this for Spadefoot. So if we can uh, communicate with Eversource and get revisions made, or BSE and get revisions made prior to the meeting, we might do that. If not, um, we'll have recommendations for uh, modifications to the plan. But just wanted to present that initially and make sure you guys were aware of it. And Aaron, can you remind me if they're proposing to do anything with the beavers out there? <clears throat> yes. So there's, as part of this proposal, you know, part of this is mitigation you know, part of our agreement with them to allow them to do this mitigation is that they remove the beavers that are out there that are flooding the entire property. Um, the beavers are also flooding the Eversource right of way and creating a safety issue. And um, it's just becoming more and more flooded out there by the day. So they're, they're planning to remove the beavers and then do this um, do their replication on the site kind of as an exchange of uh, um, uh, benefits for both of us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just saw something on the map about beavers and I just couldn't remember where that stood, so thank you. Brett, by way of background, could I just give the commission just one minute of background? You know, why spadefoot toads, why, why here? Um, so, um, as you may recall, this parcel, which is about, I think it's about 23 acres, we acquired in a partnership with Kestrel Trust. It was part of a much larger preservation effort that spans over into Hadley. It's about 190 acres. Um, and it was one of the largest farms on the Hadley side, um, one of the largest unprotected farms in Hadley. Um, so long story short, um, I've been doing research over on Eastern Spadefoot Toads in Hadley, Sunderland, um, for 20 odd years. 
working with the state, working with local folks. And we have quite a network now of, of Spadefoot uh, enthusiasts that go out there in the summer and, and try to look for them. And the bottom line is what we're finding is that um, one of the limiting factors, of course, is the, the temporary ponds that they use, um, which often are in conflict with farmers' um, goals and objectives on their property. So um, we, as we looked at this, this is contiguous with some, some areas that I have found spadefoots in Hadley, and we thought, ah, this land is now permanently protected. The habitat is reasonable, open, um, you know, farmland. And I think uh, as Aaron and I spoke and, and we'll speak to the state folks, you know, the idea is that if, if uh, uh, Eversource is willing to create a vernal pool to the specifications that, that meet the state's requirements for spadefoots, um, that this might be an interesting pilot project. It's accessible. It could be a great education program. Um, we want to make sure we do something there that um, doesn't um, to um, to significantly impact um, future uses of that of that field, we talked about perhaps doing community gardens, um, maybe uh, leasing some of the land out to farmers. So we think there's a potential win-win. So that's kind of rounding out why why now why there why why Eastern Spadefoot, um, but they are they are um, certainly losing habitat and losing uh, losing numbers throughout the state. So. And this is one of the only areas that they occur uh, in the state of Massachusetts. So, thanks. Yeah, Dave, just being kind of selfish from the UMass side of things, is Scott Jackson aware of this? Because I think he and some of his classes would be extremely interested in visiting this. I don't know if anything they could do to help, but it's a great Absolutely. example. Of what we're He's to not do. aware of this because it's really just kind of evolved over the last couple of weeks, but you know, I'm regularly in touch with Scott and we could easily loop him in. Um, and as you said, it might be a very interesting, um, there's another one of these that um, um, I helped work on with actually Pete Westover, who's on this call as well, years ago up in Sunderland. And so uh, we, uh, we worked with the state and Kestrel and, and, and they created a, 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 a vernal pool specifically designed for Spadefoots. The Spadefoots haven't found it yet, but we're still hopeful. <laughs> You could also translocate eggs or tadpoles from a known pond to one of these ponds, and then um, they disperse, the spadefoot young disperse around the pond, and then hopefully come back to that, that pool when it fills to breed again. So um, lots of potential for study and, and research and whatnot here. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. That's exciting. And yeah, great location, great, yeah, great project. Um, so the next item I wanted to bring up before we get too deep in the in the reads tonight is that um, for November we have some scheduling issues. Um, the second meeting of the second um, Wednesday in November is Veterans Day and then the fourth Wednesday is the day before Thanksgiving and um, and then so it doesn't leave us too many options really for meetings in November. Um, one possibility for us to consider is November 18th, which falls between the 11th and the 25th on a Wednesday. Um, I don't know about commissioner availability that day or that evening. Um, and then um, in December, the 9th is fine. Um, the 23rd is the day before Christmas Eve. And so I just wanted to give you guys a heads up about this before we start continuing hearings tonight because I just am concerned. Uh, we already have a request for a continuation the first meeting in November and we're not going to be holding that regularly scheduled meeting. Um, I know we had discussed this really early in the year, like January, and there was some talk about just canceling the November meeting, but business has been so heavy that um, I worry about that. I mean, if we could try to have one meeting in November and one meeting in December, I think that would be beneficial. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, yeah, none in November, one in December, we're just gonna get hammered later on. So even just being selfish, I think. Yeah. Um, so the 18th works for me. 
So I assume you're proposing it, Aaron, so that it works for you. Um, what about other commissioners? Does the 18th work? Can we at least get a quorum that day? Um, yes, that works for me. That works for me as well. For me too. Maybe. Works, works for me. I won't be here in the 11th anyway, so that's that 18th works fine. Okay, good. Okay, so okay. that schedules, that's, that settles that. And then um, for December, do you think just having the meeting on the regularly scheduled meeting on the 9th and canceling the meeting on the 23rd would be the prudent thing to do? Well, we definitely want to cancel the 23rd. Okay. Um, I just don't think we'll get a good turnout that day. I mean, we can do one after that if need be, but usually, usually things slow down a little bit around there, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, so I, maybe we can just punt at this point, Aaron. And okay. on, uh, I mean, we, yeah, I guess we can send everyone an email because probably deciding on the ninth be too late. But. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think we're going to be rescheduling anything to the ninth, uh, continuing anything to the ninth tonight. So we could just plan on scheduling for the 18th and then see what happens. Um, I mean, we can plan to keep the ninth on, but um, as of right now, nothing is scheduled for that day. Um, but the 23rd, I think, doesn't make any sense to keep on. So, okay. just FYI, if we have a meeting on the ninth and then we and we cancel the 23rd, which sounds like it's our current plan, we go from December 9th to January 13th without a meeting. Which I mean, it's not the worst, but thought that would be a helpful data point as we think about this. Yeah, yeah definitely. And I mean, um, depending on business, I mean, like, like Brett said, I think a lot of times with other, you know, concoms I've worked for, winter is a very slow or it slows down significantly, but it's the business has picked up so dramatically over this fall that it's tough to gauge right now with COVID because there's so many projects going on that might otherwise not be. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, probably at least tentatively, we should pencil in, let's say, for the, would that be the 16th? Of December? Yeah. I mean, so if need be, but yeah, hopefully we don't need it. Yeah. So there's, so there's the Wednesdays in December are the 2nd, 9th, 16th, 23rd, and 30th. Um, the 30th might also be an option. I mean, it's, uh, but I think a lot of times people go away between Christmas and New Year's too. So that might not be a great week to do it. But um, I mean, I'm good with whatever you guys decide and the 16th is fine for me too, so. Yeah, I don't know how many people are traveling this year anyways, so. That's you know. true, that's also true. <laughs> well, at least we know what we're doing for November. We can, uh, we can, um, strategize for December when we get there. Okay. Um, do you want me to jump to some other business since we have just a few more minutes before the first hearing? Yeah, and then for our 730, isn't that one being continued? It is. Okay, I'm just checking on that. And so anybody who, fellow commissioners and people from the public, just let you know 730 is going to be continued and that's the, the UMass dredging one. Yep. And we don't have another hearing until 7.40, uh, but I have plenty of other business to keep us occupied until then. So I'll jump to other business and then we can pivot back. Um, so I think this might be the easiest one for us to jump to right away. Um, I uh, got an email from a staff person at Amherst College with a request for an emergency certification to repair a bridge which they discovered had a safety issue they're not looking to re um, they're not looking to replace the bridge they're not looking to do anything dramatic just do some hand dug footing replacements just to keep the bridge safe for people using it um, I know the pictures are kind of hard to see but there's um, in the bottom the bottom two photos there's some close-ups that the the edge of the bridge is basically sort of on the edge of a on the edge of a bank right now which is on the verge of collapsing so they more or less just wanted to put some posts underneath it just to hold it um, and make it safe temporarily till they kind of figure out a long-term plan is kind of my understanding 
So that makes sense. And I'm sorry if you already mentioned it, Erin. Where is this bridge? Um, it's, it's on Amherst College property. Yep. And um, I'm in talks with Amherst College because they're doing some, some work on their trail systems and some, they've got some bridge replacement projects that are coming down the pike. But um, this is just a, an emergency or a, an immediate safety concern that they would like to just shore this up so no one gets hurt. But do you know where on Amherst? Um, college this one is? Um, I don't know the exact pinpoint location. Um, I've been, they've given me a couple different bridge location points um, that are in the property um, that okay. runs parallel to um, College Street. Um, um in that land there and i'm i'm yeah. assuming that this is one of those that they sent me a map of okay yeah i don't have a problem with this just curious and yeah i, I was talking with kate sims the other day and i think she said she's going to be bringing a bunch of stuff in front of us coming up so. yes yep so okay um so is anybody is there anything else on that Aaron? or does anybody have any questions on this one yeah i think this is yeah, yeah they, and just as an FYI, they, they, with this storm that happened just a few days ago, they got a lot of dead or a lot of trees fell down over their trails and they are planning to clean up a lot of the trees that fell. I let them know, you know, if, a, if a tree is dead or a limb is dead down in the, in the path, it's okay to, you know, move it or, or clear it, but that they can't take down any live trees. So I did let them know that. Yeah, they have a couple of fairly decadent stands there that are, they're mature and they're going to be coming down pretty soon by themselves. Like some of those pine stands are dangerous. So. So. Okay, so um, I'm not hearing anything. So I guess we're looking for a motion at this point for emergency cert for the bridge on Amherst College. So nobody has to jump, but yeah. I have how to. About, how, how about so moved? That works. So, so we have a motion from Larry looking for a second. Second. Thank you. Okay. So uh, vote at this point. So Larry. Yes. Leroy. Aye. Jen. Aye. Anna. Abstain. Laura. Aye. And I from me. So, yep. Um, and I should also mention that we got a note from Fletcher and he, uh, he apologizes for not being able to make it tonight. So. And okay. He's going to be here next time. So um, I'll just jump back up to the UMass Dredge project. Um, they were scheduled for 7.30 and um, in your meeting packets this week that I shared via OneDrive was the correspondence for Mickey Marcus requesting the extension. There was also a document, which is the MEPA certificate that Mickey sent. So um, that document is available for your review. They did request um, a continuation to November. And then at that point, I think they're basically going to more or less start over because they've had so many revisions to the project uh, since the initial presentation that they're going to basically start over with a presentation in November from what I understand. Okay and this uh, we didn't open this one yet so we don't really need a continuation is that correct? No we did open it. Yeah, did. Um, okay. It was opened um, I believe at the end of last year okay. but they've been dealing with um, it, getting um, MEPA certificate for a one water quality certification, a lot of permits from Boston that um, take quite a long time. And so they've just been requesting continuances. Okay, I remember, yeah, I remember they um, re or they told us about this a long time ago, but yeah. mm -hmm. excellent. Okay, so that means that we need a motion for continuation. And so that would be on the 18th of November. And do you have a time for us, Aaron? A 7.30. I move to continue this to the 18th of November at 7.30 p.m. Second. Okay, going for a voice vote. Laura? Aye. 
Anna? Aye. Jen? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Larry? Aye. And I for me as well. <laughs> okay. So All right. we'll have time for at least one more. Yes. Um Okay, so um, we received a request for certificate of compliance from 426 State Street. Uh, you guys may recall this was a, a small single family home that needed a new distribution um, connection from the roadway up to the home. It was through a BVW and Riverfront, so we did require $2,500 um, be provided to the town for restoration plantings along the Mill River and Cushman Brook. Those funds were provided to us. I did go out and I, I've worked really closely with um, BSC and Eversource. I did a pre-construction out there, inspected erosion controls. After the work was done, I went out and did an inspection and uh, gave them permission to remove erosion controls. The site is I mean, I don't know if anybody else has taken a ride by here, but I was shocked to see how little impact, I mean, relatively from prior to the work to after the work, it was just really, they did a great job um, and everything has come back more than 75% revegetated. And uh, so I would recommend that the board issue a complete, um, a complete certificate of compliance on the project. Sounds good. Anybody have any questions on this one? Nope. Nope. Sounds oh. good. Okay. So looking for a motion for a certificate of completion. Yep. I move to issue a certificate of completion for 426 State Street. Second. Second. Okay. So I'm not quite sure who got the second, but Aaron will All figure right. that one out. <laughs> so, um, okay. So voice vote. Anna? Aye. Larry? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. So, did I get everybody? Okay. And I for me as well. So, Fabulous. Jumping around. I got to figure out a better way to do that. Um, okay. So, one more. one more thing that we could just handle right now if the board wants to. Um, so later in the meeting, we are going to have a request for determination come before the board for um, there was a compromised cable that was brought to our attention that runs from Podic substation to the Sunderland town line. Um, I issued an emergency certification to Eversource to begin work um, on the cable as of October 1st, um, but they did file a request for determination I mean, within a matter of days after the emergency cert was issued. And the reason for that was because um, they're not sure that they'd be able to complete the work within the 30 day window of the emergency certification. So they wanted to get started on it as soon as possible because a number of people along the line between Podic and I guess it goes a ways into Sunderland um, have been continually losing power because of the compromise line. So they wanted to start on it as soon as possible, but they're also going to be picking up after the 30 days with a request for determination. So essentially what I'd be looking for from the board on this is just to ratify the emergency certification that was issued to them already. Okay, and then the RDA is, will do that separately? <laughs> yeah, that'll be um, the fourth hearing, I guess, of the CMA. I mean, the fourth time on the agenda this evening. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So looking for a motion, unless there's any questions or comments on this one, looking for a motion for emergent to ratify the emergency cert. So moved. Second. Okay. Voice vote. Anna? Aye. Laura? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Leroy? Aye. And I for me as well. Okay. And by magic, thank you very much, Aaron, for your magic. It's exactly 740. 
Okay, so uh, if you are here for the continued Tofino um, hearings, uh, if you can raise your hand. And so Ted, I assume you are here for that. Uh, the panelist. And then I do see Art here as well. And then Kristen as well. Okay, um, so Kristen, Ted, and Art, you should all have uh, been, been promoted to panelists at this point, so you're all able to speak. Um, and so just as a reminder, we are now opening our Tofino hearings. Um, oof, I'm trying to remember which ones we're dealing with, because there's a, are we dealing with one, two, five, six, seven, eight? I thought we we're just dealing with a few of them today, Aaron. No one and two. Yeah, there was some confusion at the last meeting about which ones were being continued and which ones were not. Um, from what I understand, um, lots one and two were were being paused basically for them to kind of figure out um, what they were doing with those. And if I remember correct, they were going to come back today and kind of give us sort of an update on one and two. Um, yeah, I think we continued them just as a courtesy for them to, to give them a little time um, mm -hmm. to figure that out. But after today, I think uh, re, 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 um, kind of re, redetermine how to move forward. Okay, so why don't we just start off with one and two. And so, Ted, are there any updates on this? So we cannot hear you at this point, Ted. Uh, How about now? Uh, we can. Yes, okay. Um, I actually requested at the last meeting that one and two be, um, I didn't know what the term was that Aaron had used in the previous meeting, suspended, whatever the term was that would require re-notification of the abutters when we figured out what we wanted to do. Okay. Okay, so you'd like to, okay, so why don't we, as long as you're still good with that, why don't we go ahead, Aaron? And so can you tell us the technical side of that, Aaron, of how we want to do that, table it, suspend it? Yeah, I mean, so I think that the issue I had raised at the last meeting with that is, so that there's, there's a couple processes that you can go through with that. You can ask the board to render a decision and just, I mean, the board could essentially deny it and then you could reapply. That's one option. Another option is to withdraw. And then the third option is essentially just to let the continuation, the public hearing lapse, which would require reopening of the public hearing by notifying abutters and reposting a legal ad. The only problem I have with that last third option is that I'd like to have some kind of a ballpark idea of when we would be reposting them because keeping them hanging open for a long period of time is just not not a good practice. Um, typically, they'll just be withdrawn if there's going to be a long period of time between, um, you know, the review and and you know when they're going to be um, reexamined. So I think I think that the idea was that we were going to get an idea of whether it was going to be in the near future or kind of if they were going to be withdrawn and then reapply or kind of how to broach that. So Ted, do you have any sort of ballpark that you can give us or any thoughts from the owner? Uh, the owner was waiting to see what the um, uh, disposition of the other lots was going to be. <laughs> and so I, what, does withdrawing them involve having to complete another application with another fee and the entire process starts again? You would reapply. Um, yes. I, the commission could theoretically waive the application fee if they know that you're going to be coming back. Um, but if the plans are going to change in any dramatic fashion, um, from what's already been submitted, I would probably recommend that you withdraw them and reapply. And you could also, you know, ask the commission to waive the application fee since it was already paid. Um, 
Yeah, and I assume that the owner's not here. So even after we decide on the other lots, Ted, you're gonna to need to go back to the owner? Yes. Okay, which means that we're not gonna have any sort of decision on one and two. So these two would still be dragging on, which is less than ideal. Um, how about how about we revisit it at the end of the uh, after we just determine what's going to happen with the other four in this meeting and then i'll I, I can probably make some kind of judgment call about it okay fair enough so let's get back to those okay so then related to five six seven eight um this is where we asked for a third party um, peer review for this. And so Aaron was able to secure those services. And so, uh, Art, if you want to introduce yourself and give uh, a little background on yourself, and then if you could summarize the letter, which, um, or the, yeah, the report that you provided, that'd be great. Could I, could I modify something on that? Why don't we talk about what the contract was? Because there's two parts to that contract. Um, yeah, Aaron, do you want to describe what the contract was? Yeah, so the board had decided um, in the motion that was made to have a desktop review completed first. And that's what that's what um, Art is going to be presenting in a moment. Um, the other was to get a recommendation from Art on whether a field um, field-based review would be recommended by him. And so I'll let him d touch on that. But I, what I will say is that in the contract that was written up um, and the proposal that was written up by Art, the contract that was written by the town and the fee that was collected from the applicant, it accounted for the field-based review portion if Art goes in that direction. So that is covered already if, if we go that route. So just as a heads up on that. Thank you. Okay, Art, the floor is yours. Good evening, um, Art Allen from Ecotech Incorporated. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. So just for background, I'm the Vice President of Ecotech Incorporated, a small environmental consulting firm in out of Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, I've been with Ecotech since 1995. I've completed uh, peer review projects in 37 cities and towns across Massachusetts, including reviewing uh, wetland delineations, wildlife habitat studies, uh, vernal pools, mitigation plans, Wetland Protection Act and bylaw filings. Um, in particular, I've, this will be my fifth uh, project uh, for the Amherst Conservation Commission for peer review. The most recent was for Lot 33 University Ave in 2015 when Beth Wilson was the administrator. Um, I also work with Erin when she was with Sturbridge Conservation Commission and I can continue to consult for Sturbridge on a regular basis. So that's a little bit of background on me. And then um, regarding the uh, SWCA um, vernal pool assessment and my desktop review, I noted that uh, they refer to it as a potential vernal pool, although from my review, it doesn't, does not appear to be mapped. Um, as you might know, potential vernal pools are typically referred to the ones that were um, remotely mapped uh, by Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program some years ago, um, and those are published on GIS. But this one does not appear on either the uh, potential vernal pool or certified uh, vernal pool map layers. Um, but it does fall within a bordering vegetated wetland and also within a map, uh, rare species estimated in priority habitat uh, that's known as PH1319. Uh, it's not known to me what species are, are utilizing the mapped habitat, but it's quite possible that they may also be um, utilizing the vernal pool. I anticipate uh, the Natural Heritage will consider this possibility and review any proposed project, although Aaron informed me that um, they've waived at least some of the lots in this subdivision from review. So that's um, not, may not be subject, but just, uh, just wanted to mention it. Uh, regarding the assessment itself, 
Um, I thought it was thorough and well documented. It was completed at the proper time of the year uh, using appropriate field techniques. Um, and the results indicated that obligate vernal pool breeding amphibians, namely spotted salamanders and wood frogs, were su quite successfully reproducing within the vernal pool depression at the time of the evaluation, which was April 2019. Um, and the results of this assessment should be sufficient to certify the vernal pool through the Nat Natural Heritage Program. And I, I do recommend that certification of the of the pool be pursued if at all possible, um, in theory, in agreement with the applicant owner. Um, one, uh, probably my major um, comment on the, uh, the assessment and the mapping, um, the, the assessment and the site plans indicate that the limits of the vernal pool were somehow identified and that they fall largely within the BVW boundaries particularly on lots five, six, seven, and eight. Um, and that's important because basically the, the way they've mapped the vernal pool boundary, it falls well within um, the, the, the 100 foot buffer zone to the BVW and basically allows them room to build on all of those, um, those, those uh, four lots, notwithstanding the, uh, the Amherst wetland bylaw requirement for the 100 foot um, uh, vernal pool setback. So, um, and as the commission's aware, the Amherst uh, bylaw regulations provide specific guidance on defining the vernal, vernal pool boundary at section uh, 5E2D. Um, and I just recommend that it be confirmed that this guidance was followed um, with independent field confirmation as necessary and in my experience, it's not unusual that the vernal pool boundary falls within the BVW boundary, but it's also not unusual for the vernal pool boundary to come up to or even extend outside the BVW boundary in some cases. So that would be, uh, that would be my concern and the, and the primary reason to have um, an independent review of that boundary um, uh, unless the commission is comfortable uh, with the way it was, uh, it was with the way it was determined. Thank you. Thank you, Art. So that's great. So that's very helpful. That definitely gives us some additional insight, um, a little bit more, yeah, information. So hopefully we can figure out sort of next steps with this. And so, um, Aaron, I'll start off with you. Did you have any additional pieces that you wanted to add before I open up to the commission? Well, I have a question for Art actually um, about the kind of the overall plan that was associated with the um, application for these lots. It was my observation that it was a really um, sort of square shaped polygon within the BVW um, as it was delineated, the vernal pool. and. I guess I just wanted to get your opinion on that because to me, a, a shape like that would be very unusual for a vernal pool to be sort of in a square shape. And um, I guess that's kind of what alarmed me about the plans was kind of that, that awkwardly square shape um, in terms of like the waypoints or whatever they use to define the boundary. Right, yeah, I mean, it. it I mean, it appeared to be based on, you know, kind of point to point between flags, but again, there was no, there was, I didn't see any documentation as to how they established it. Um, so yeah, I, I really can't, having not seen it or even seen any, any uh, documentation of how it was established, I really, I really can't opine further. Yeah, that that's understandable. I I was out there myself looking at it. Um, I believe in early June with um, the applicant's representative, and to me, it was a very sort of natural, rounded shape, the basin that was within that BBW, and so it it doesn't square really with what I saw in the field. Um, and I do have photos and even video from that site walk if anybody's interested in looking at it. 
but um, I just wanted to to point that out because that to me was very unusual about the the vernal pool within the BVW. Yeah, and Ted, also if you have any comments or questions, um, feel free to, to pipe in. Well, I think Kristen is better able to um, opine okay. about how and to describe how she determined the border, the, the edges of the vernal pool. And Kristen, I would invite you to do that if you're Sure, thanks, Ted. Um, can I share my screen with everybody? Is that possible? In theory, yes. <laughs> yeah, you should have the ability to do that. Okay, so this is the plan. I actually only just received this today. I'm Kristen McDonough, by the way, with SWCA. Um, I did a vernal pool assessment out here in 2019, late April. Um, so let me get my annotation here. So this boundary right here is the BVW. Mm -hmm. The, um, let me just draw that. The vernal pool boundary follows the BVW boundary along the Eastern edge. And as you can see on this plan here, that's kind of where the topography slopes further down. On the southern end, the BVW extends a little bit beyond the vernal pool boundary. And then on the western side, the BVW extends a little bit beyond the vernal pool boundary. Um, that's because there was no standing water. And that was based on two different field assessments completed in 2017 and 2019, both completed during high water spring. Um, so where it's BVW and not Vernal Pool Basin, I was finding more red maple swamp, but without standing water, where there could not be breeding habitat for amphibians. So there were probably hydric soils and hydrophytic vegetation, but no standing water where amphibians would be capable of breeding. And that's why the Vernal Pool boundary is a little bit smaller on that western side. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as that boxy area, Erin, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Are you talking about this little, let me clear my, are you talking about this right here at lot eight? Yes, I'm talking about that sort of zigzaggy uh, shape between the middle of eight and um, the middle of seven there, where it kind of jogs out like that. Yeah, I, I honestly, I can't speak to any specific memory of why it goes in there other than maybe it's just the way the vertices were plotted. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's kind of what I suspected too. Yeah, um, but I can tell you that, that the delineation of the Vernal Pool Basin was based on standing water during period of seasonal high water. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. So I think that answered one of your questions, Art, about how the delineation was done. Yes, it did. Thank you. So, okay. Um, so, commissioners, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, overall, I think it was nice to, uh, it's very helpful to have your uh, report art. I think that just sort of helps validate what was done out there. Um, in my mind, the biggest question is just sort of that delineation. Uh, and it's not second guessing, you know, what's out there, but just to make sure that we're comfortable with where that's at. And it sounds like, this is Art Allen again, it sounds like Erin has seen it. So uh, I know she had, she voiced concerns about the shape of it, but Erin, did you did you feel that what's on the plan act fairly accurately represented the extent of ponding or? Um, I, I agree um, with regard to the toe of the slope um, that Kristen referenced. Let me. Um, just grab a pen and following following that line um, along sort of where I guess I guess lots I think lots one and two were in that vicinity is that right Ted 
lot, uh, I'm sorry, I, I Lots like one and two are like, right. Yeah. Lots one and two. I think I see the one and two. Yeah. On those are lots one and two. That's right. <sighs> okay. Yeah. So I, that boundary there, I, I remember seeing and uh, have, have a, um, I, I don't have any issue with that. I think what I take issue with, and you know, maybe it's just my, sort of knowledge of natural systems coupled with my knowledge of GIS is that this just does not look like a natural formation, I guess you could say. And what I saw in the field was a very sort of smooth, rounded, you know, a smooth natural shaped boundary. Um, following the curvature of the topography. And so it's, it's, I, what, what jumped out at me, what, what kind of called it out to me was looking at the uh, lots seven and eight, the, the vernal pool boundary as it's shown on, on lot seven and eight is just like a straight line. The vernal pool boundary is just a straight line and um, just didn't look like anything that would have jumped out at me in the field in terms of like a really straight straight line um, defining that that ponding. I, I did walk all the way around it and took pictures, um, which I'm happy to share, but. Can I make one comment? Of course. Um, if you look at the, the, the vertex of the vernal pool as it's defined that is on the lot line between lot seven and eight, mm -hmm. and then you go to the, 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 the vertex that, barely seems to touch the middle of the back lot line of lot eight. Even if you were to connect those together and extend the vernal pool out to there, it wouldn't change the buffer because the buffer is swung as a series of arcs from the outer edge of the, vertice, the vertices. Do you follow? I see what you're saying, Ted. Like, even if this was, say this was an error point and it was just bad GPS, because we, we're not a survey company. This vernal pool was not surveyed. This was GPS. So it is submeter accurate. But let's say we, for hypothetical, we had bad accuracy on that point and it should have been here or something. Is it going to change the buffer zone if this is the actual no, vernal pool line? No, it will not. It will not because the buffer zone is taken by, by taking a hundred foot radius and swinging an arc from the outer vertices. And then where those radii connect is how you define the buffer zone. And if you look at the buffer zone, you can see that the, it, the, the, the arc that goes from the number seven to the number eight is swung from that outer vertice. And then the arc that, that covers eight is swung from the vertice, the, the vertex that's uh, behind the middle of lot eight. Well, and I, those I, arcs would still connect out there. Uh, but Ted, if you look at just under the number eight, there's like a little dimple and that would go farther out. So but I that, think that the, the buffer zone is drawn, that, that dark blue buffer zone line that's drawn is drawn from the BVW. That's not from the, from the vernal pool. That's incorrect. That dark blue line is drawn as a buffer from the from the vernal pool. The hundred foot buffer. If you if you go to the, okay. the can you call up the the lot eight plan and the lot seven plan, the individual plans? Yeah, I can do that. Um, because if you do that, then you can see that the the BBW buffers are also on those plans, and there's a difference between the BBW buffer and the vernal pool buffer. Can I ask for an explanation about that? Why doesn't why doesn't the buffer go directly with what the delineation of the vernal pool is? Um, maybe maybe I could answer that. So, so the the basically water equals wetland, but wetland doesn't necessarily always equal water. So the wetland can have. Um, hydrology, hydrophytic vegetation, and hydric soils, but the vernal pool basin needs to have surface water for it to be breeding habitat for amphibians. So where you have kind of just a mucky red maple swamp at high water, if there is no surface water, it won't be feeding habitat or breeding habitat for the larvae or for the breeding adults. 
I still don't understand where the radius is drawn from because that it seems to me it it supposed to be fifth, the dip distance is a hundred foot from the actual pool. This is lot eight, Ted. I'm not sure if that's helpful. I, if you can, if you can move it to the, if you can move it up on the screen a little bit. So you can see that the hundred foot buffer swung from the from the vertices of the BBW is further out than the hundred foot buffer that swung from the vertex of the vernal pool. Who is the, who has defined the uh, the hundred foot PVP buffer? What do you mean? Who's defined it? I don't understand the question. I see the line. Somebody wrote draw that line. Who defined it? And how did uh, they do it? And how did they do it? Mike Liu did it on CAD by swinging a hundred foot arc from the vertex, from the vertex. Why the, why the vertexes? Because that's the furthest point out. That gives you the largest buffer. Well, you can shoot, I mean, well. Because if, if you swing an arc from an inner buffer, from an inner vertex, it's just going to be within the buffer that you swung from the outer vertex. Is that, I'm, not I, used I, to, I'm not used to working in CAD. I'm used to working in GIS where you can just draw a hundred foot offset from the from the line. So I it's with you. that's what the that's what I'm confused about. Yeah. Well, from a CAD but, standpoint, but, this is making sense though, guys. Like this is, this is Ted is Ted is exactly right. Like even if you were to smooth the vernal pool boundary, the hundred foot PVP bu buffer wouldn't change significantly. I mean, there's a small dimple there, Brett, you're right, but it might come up a little bit closer to that 380, like, um, con you know, grading contour, but not a lot. So this I, I, isn't like... So, uh, and I guess my comment is just this, you know, looking at this plan, lot eight, and seeing that square-shaped vernal pool in the corner of it, my uh, analytic eye says that's not right. That's not an accurate point. Uh, that's not an accurate drawing. So if I'm automatically assuming that's not accurate, it just makes me wonder what else isn't accurate about it, I guess. Um, but that's also a function of scale, Aaron. It's a number of vertices they decided to, to put in. They just didn't put a lot in there or they dropped them or something. And actually they, they probably picked the worst ones. These two seem to kind of, even though this one's kind of squared, Erin, I'm just noticing that those do kind of follow the wetland and the vernal pool basin kind of do follow that. I mean, I wish I could give you more specifics. This was, this was a couple of years ago. So I don't really, a year and a half ago, I don't really remember why that vertex was picked and a different vertex was picked. Um, you know, I know that I hemmed and hawed for a long time at the southern tip. That's where I met one of the neighbors. Um, there was definitely no standing water on that whole tail at the southern end, south of lot six. And I don't know, maybe there was a tip up tree fall. I wish I could give you more information. I just don't remember the specifics. Well, I just remember I walked the site during you know, vernal pool season in early June. And I remember it being sort of a, a round shaped basin in the middle of the vernal pool of standing water, round all the way around following the topography of the land as opposed to a sort of zigzagged polygon shape like that. And so to me, it screams error, um, but it's really up to the board to how you want to proceed. It's just, it does not look accurate to me um, or doesn't look like it follows the standing water pattern that I saw when I visually saw it in the field. Isn't this one of the problems without certification that it can change slightly from year to year? Even with certification, it still could, but. Well, well but doesn't certification establish a boundary? It does, yeah. No. Yeah. Whether so without a certification, we can it can it could change next June from what it is now. Smaller or bigger, yeah. That's right. I agree. Exactly. You know, yeah, and that's that's probably why people don't want to certify it. 
anyway, that's another, that's an off, off comment anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think this was fixed, it's or quote unquote fixed or changed, it's not going to make a big difference on this map. Right. That 100 foot is. Right. Um, that doesn't negate the issue of do we want um, sort of a second opinion on where the uh, border is all around. And so, I mean, I think that that's probably one of the bigger decisions that we have in front of us. And so that is what we have the contract set up to do if we want to exercise that. Um, obviously, so Art, when would be, so likely that would not happen until April-ish? Correct, yes. Yeah, and I think it's just kind of unfortunate, Aaron, zooming in on this one, it looks really bad. <laughs> uh, looking at the larger one, it's not nearly as bad. So it's not great, but not nearly as bad. This one's bad. I could I could add one comment. Um, in your bylaw, you give a number of different methods for establishing the boundary, although you do say that it's the largest of any of the, the you know, the largest boundary given by any of the methods. And typically, you know, observations of the actual ponding in that high water season give you the, typically give you the largest boundaries so and I think it's just a scale issue but yeah number of vertices and all of that sort of stuff that was thrown in so I doubt is there any sort of standard for that like number of points that are supposed to be thrown in like every 20 feet art or anything like that or or Aaron Kristen I mean normally I delineate the actual boundary and that and the flags are survey located so I mean that's okay. that's how I do it so it wouldn't be quite as chunky as it is, is what you're suggesting. Right. I mean, I'd have an adequate number of flags to actually define the boundary. And, and, okay. You know, it would be spot on, basically. So if there, if there had been more points, field points noted, then it would have smoothed the curve on that side of the, of the, um, of the vernal pool. That's right. Yes. But it, but it would not necessarily have made the buffer any bigger. Also, alternatively, the vernal pool boundary flags weren't surveyed. So that was collected with a Trimble GPS unit. So just wanted to make sure that that's clear. The BVW boundary was surveyed, but not the vernal pool boundary. That was, the GPS unit is capable of submeter accuracy, but it's not survey grade. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't necessarily get that good under a tree canopy either, so. True. And whatever the commission approves is good for three years here. So, I mean, you guys have to be confident that what you're approving is accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so the easy thing to do is just go for third party. I mean, that's the easiest thing. Kristen, would you pull up the larger site plan again? Would you mind? No, or, no. Thanks. I just want to. Am I too zoomed in? Um, can you zoom in out a tiny bit? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. I mean, personally, I don't think. I mean, assuming that it's close to being accurate, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference in our decisions here. If it's close to accurate, that's the big question for me, though. I mean, one of the things that's going to happen is that it, it, it potentially will affect seven and eight. Five and six are probably going to end up being OK. Um, So particularly five. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Let me ask another question about this process. I mean, uh, if we delineate that hundred foot vernal pool boundary, what are we going to say can happen inside of that boundary? Nothing. Zero. How, yeah, well, that's what I, I agree, but that, how do, how are we going to protect that? And what is it going to do to the property? 
what we often do is do things like boulder monuments um, to so that landowners know that that's 100 foot no disturb. And I agree, and that's that's what I'm actually pointing at. Is in particular like eight and seven, you really pretty well wop out the property. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sure that Aaron's right, so I'm guessing that everything is going to get sort of pushed out and rounded out a bit. So. Yeah, even if you get rid of the 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 the, the, the radius lines, if you sort of smooth that line in, it does impact the both of those properties, seven and eight. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, it's not a lot. No, I know, but it, but well, uh, yeah, but the, the point I'm making has to do with who wants a house that is you can't step out the backside because you're in a vernal pool designated area. Yeah, well, I that's what you're saying. Up to us. Our job is to, you know, protect the resource. I agree. <laughs> yep. So that's up for yeah the owner and subsequent owners to figure that out, but. So it seems like there's option A, which is wait till the spring, re, re delineate and do you know a survey grade delineation. Option B is do that, but only for only applicable to seven and eight, which would mean moving forward with five and six now. Or option C is acknowledge that even if it's redelineated to serve it to survey grade, it probably wouldn't make that big of a difference um, and move forward with all four lots now, right? I agree. Mm -hmm. Yep, well put, Jen. Um, one thing too is that you guys had asked Art for his, his opinion on whether or not a field review should be conducted. And I think, I think Art you agreed that there should be a, f a field review to um, just as a secondary to, to check that boundary. Well, yeah, I mean, I, all I can see is what's on paper. Again, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm very, you know, I, I'm very confident in the results of the assessment, especially where it's, positive in terms of indicating a vernal pool. Normally when I'm asked to look at these, the assessment is negative and, and I'm trying to prove that it is a pool. But in this case, you know, they've, they've proved themselves that it, that it is a pool. So the only outstanding question in my mind is, uh, you know, is the boundary and obviously it's critical. I mean, to me, it appears to be critical to six, seven and eight, but, um, but having not seen it, you know, I, I know you've been out there, Aaron. So, you know, you're the, as, as far, you know, in terms of this discussion tonight, you, you seem to be the person with the, you know, the independent person with the most direct knowledge. And, um, you know, my my personal opinion would be if, you know, if, if you're not comfortable with what you saw out there, then then it probably should be reviewed. But, but uh, yeah, I I can only say it's, you know, I've seen ponding out to the edge of the wetland. I've seen it even ex extend beyond the wetland in a few cases, but um, so yeah, that's that's about all I can say. Yeah, and I, I did upload um, some pictures to commission members OneDrive box and um, in the Tofino folder, and there is a video in there which shows, I believe I was standing at lot two, sort of um, spanning from, uh, it's hard to get a directional here, but I think it was sort of like north to south, kind of spinning around and just gives you a really good idea of the natural shape of the vernal pool um, with standing water in it. And like I said, I, I think on that, on that side facing lots one and two, I, I wouldn't necessarily dispute that. Just on the other side, it's it's very 
I do, I do agree that there's, there's, it's, it's, um, it's a winding line, you know, there's par parts where it kind of juts out around, you know, um, hummocks and trees and roots and things. And then there's parts where it cuts back in, but it's just a, <sighs> It was, it was a, my observation was that it was sort of a, a, a winding line as opposed to just like these straight zigzags. Um, but I don't, it doesn't look like what I saw in the field, but it's, it's really up to the board. I mean, I think the BVW line more accurately sort of represents what I saw in terms of standing water. But I, I mean, so I think like, you know, the zigzags are an artifact of how the wetland was delineated, which was by GPS. So mm -hmm. we kind of know that that's not necessarily wrong. It's just how it was delineated. So the question is, are we okay with that delineation or do we need a survey grade delineation that might capture more of those fine contours? I don't think it's like a right or wrong thing. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the weaknesses and strengths of the, of the methods used to delineate mm -hmm. here. Absolutely. Right. My inclination would be, I hate to postpone things and carry them on, but let's do the evaluation in the spring. Yeah, I'm definitely leaning that way. My only problem is I don't think it's going to make any difference. Right. And so, yeah, that's where I'm kind of tossed. Um, I think it will smooth out a couple of things, but overall it's not going to. That's just my hunch. So I, I can't. I have the same gut instinct, Brett. So do you have the same confusion too then, Jen? I'm not, I'm not, I'm on the fence. Yeah, I, I, I agree. You know, like I think maybe the uh, survey grade delineation might smooth some of this out in terms of like the impact of the overall decision on the lots. I don't think it'll have a huge impact. Yeah, well, I, I actually go back again with the idea that, uh, you know, I, I don't like the idea that like half of seven and eight are inside the vernal pool boundary. That's not going to change, Larry. I know that isn't, but that's still, that, that to me, as a developable lot, that bothers me, but that's outside our range. I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. What about some other commissioners? So where, where are you guys sitting at this point? Then I'll open it up to the public in a second. <coughs> no opinion. <laughs> so, okay, uh, I'll come back. So let me open it up to the public. So if there's anybody from the public who's here who would like to uh, ask questions or add comments, uh, please raise your hand and then uh, I'll make sure that you are able to speak. Oh, okay, there is one. Okay, so um, Becky, you're able to, you should be able to unmute yourself at this point. Hi, this is Becky and Mark Schneider. We're a Butters. At, um, to lot five. And, um, you know, what, what's the old adage? You measure twice and you cut once. Um, we haven't done that uh, yet. And back in the spring, we had recommended that we get an independent party to come out in the spring to assess that everything was measured accurately and uh, done properly because we have one shot at this to make sure that the environment is protected. Um, it was at that time that the applicant said that that wasn't necessary because we know it's a vernal pool and we can't build within the vernal pool boundary. So um, you all decided that that wasn't necessary at the time and now we're back taking some backward steps um, to where we were recommending in the first place. I think the delay isn't on our end. Um, we would recommend that we delay until the spring uh, so that we get the right measurements. Uh, I, I don't know why we're uh, not doing this independently and making sure that the environment is well protected. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
Okay, is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Yeah, and one thing related to that, we did um, back in the spring, it was initially said that the BVW was going to be the, the boundary. And so that's why there were some different opinions at that point. So um, let's see. So Blake, um, trying. Okay, Blake, you should be able to uh, unmute yourself at this point. You hear me there? Yes, we can. Uh, great. I just had uh, two quick questions. One was Art said there was something waived in the beginning of his presentation, and I wasn't sure. Uh, I was wondering if he would repeat what uh, aspects were waived early. And then in the for last meeting, I was noting that it was at the BVW and the Vernal Pool were the same border, and you're wondering about the leak. Should you get legally? What is the question? Did we answer that question legally in terms of that they can be separate? And that's what the switch was in the spring. And I guess I just said for the record, I, I think we should have an independent person um, conduct uh, the vernal pool border. And thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And yes, they are different borders. So they can be concurrent with each other, but they are um, separate entities. But l last week you were wondering about the le uh, before you weren't sure about it legally. And that's why you thought you needed a third person there was some aspect that you were wondering about legal. And I, I, I guess I, I don't have notes on that. Do you it remember was, that discussion? Yeah, I think it was whether in our bylaw we can have them be separate, BVW and Vernal Pool boundaries be separate boundaries. Or if we, we have to interpret the Vernal Pool and the BVW, BVW boundary as the same boundary and art has confirmed that they can be separate boundaries and that the BVW boundary can contain the wetland, the vernal pool boundary. Okay, Th thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. Okay, and art she was asked or I'm sorry, Blake was asking about something that was being waived and I can't recall what that was about. I can't either. Sorry. It was sure in the we're very beginning of your Blake? I'm sorry. Do you mean are you sure waived or do you mean that um I don't I don't remember anything about wait anything being waived. And I might have misheard him. It was this er, it was early in the presentation. He said I just wanted that to be noted. Yeah, I'm trying to pull it, it up. Is, is, okay. Yeah. Is there a report that the public can see from that? Yeah, I was wondering about that, Aaron. Um, I assume that this is not on the website, but I assume that this is publicly available. It must be. I'm sorry. The what? What? Arts, arts review. Arts um, review. I just I just got arts review, and I haven't had a chance to upload it to our website, but um, I certainly can do that. Uh, the Vernal Pool report from SWCA is on the website. Yeah, so Blake, Thank I think we, we just you. got that, I want to say it was either today or yesterday, so it's new, but yeah, we can definitely share that. Thank you. Yeah, and sorry, yeah, I'm trying to look and find something about waves, but yeah, I'm, I'm reading it and I'm not seeing anything. Um. Yeah, if you find oh, something. Oh, I know what it was. You know what it was? It was um, uh, natural habitat. Heritage, natural uh, heritage. Her natural heritage, yeah, sorry, right. excuse that's me, Ted. Yes. It was natural heritage had waived a, a, another review of these these lots in association with this application. Was that what it was? Do you, do you remember uh, that part? Um, that's that's my understanding. I, I don't know if I use that language, but that's, that's my understanding based on what Aaron had told me after I after I did my report that they had natural heritage had previously reviewed the subdivision I believe and they had declined to review the individual lots maybe Aaron could but uh, that was um, I can explain that if someone would want me to the the, the subdivision was approved and mapped and recorded and natural heritage mapped the priority habitat. Uh, an estimated habitat afterwards. Therefore, the entire subdivision and all the lots in the subdivision are, are granted a waiver from uh, natural heritage review. Um, so we, 
we, whenever we apply for an NOI for an individual lot, we have done exactly as we did here, which is submit the entire application. It goes to Natural Heritage. They then review the history of the project. And then Lauren Glory also issues an opinion that the subdivision approval predated the mapping. Therefore, Natural Heritage um, does not uh, subject it to review. Okay, thank you, Ted. So um, before I go to John, Blake, do you have anything else that you wanted to add? Well, it was, I, I guess I don't want to take up too much time on that, but so they, they didn't know, they didn't, someone didn't notice at that point it was a vernal pool and then it got waived is how, how I'm seeing that. Because when I got here, I forget it was a 205, there was clearly a vernal pool. Things have changed. I think that the vernal pool and the priority habitat are different. Um, different things. Yeah, the priority habitat is for, I think it's a turtle. I don't know if I'm it's supposed to say that. It's box, but... it's box turtles. Yeah. I got you. Thank you for explaining that. Okay, thank you, Blake. Um, so, John, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. This is John Hoover. Um, I am in a butter to um, lot eight. And um, yeah, I, I just definitely, after hearing the discussion today, um, I, uh, I have some concerns about the accuracy of those, those boundaries. Um, so I am also supportive as with my neighbors to getting an independent assessment um, in the spring when the conditions are more favorable. Thank you. Yeah, there's also the possibility it can get smaller. So it's not necessarily, yeah. Understood. So thank you. Yeah, this was a historic drought year. So. In, not in the spring, I don't think, but can I can I just um, ask Art a question? Art, in your report, you did say that you found no problems with the methodology that Kristen used for delineating, uh, identifying the the um, the, the, the vernal pool, is that right? No, I said I had no problem with the methodology for the species assessment. I said there was no documentation in the report of how the vernal pool boundary was, was identified or delineated. I and see. I questioned that. Okay. Um, so, do any other commissioners or anybody else from the public have any sort of thoughts at this point? I mean, yeah, given where I'm sitting, I have no problem with going for third party. So that's definitely the, uh, yeah, I'll say the easiest, most conservative thing to do. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm usually going to lean towards third party when it's an option. And in this case, I feel similarly that it seems like it's going to be better to get more eyes on this. So is the third party review reviewing the GPS delineation? I mean, it seems like, so they come back and they say, no, a survey grade delineation would be better. And then we're redelineating. Wait, yeah. I have a, to, to your point, Jen, I have a question for Ted. When we were out, I remember doing the original site walk there, there was two different sets of flagging out there. And I remember asking about the vernal pool flagging and you had said that was from a separate vernal pool assessment that had been done. Um, the flagging from the vernal pool assessment is, is still in place um, out there. I mean, cause you guys had like, you guys had like um, rebar for the BVW, I believe. And then there was flagging for the BV or for the vernal pool rather. Every one of those points that define the BBW is set, set with a with a with a piece of rebar and has been surveyed. Um, the information that you see on the plan today is the information that was transferred. The GPS information that and correct me if I'm wrong, Kristen. Okay, but that's the GPS data that Kristen picked up in the field, and then 
uh, uh, transmitted those points to Berkshire Design Group and Mike Liu, the landscape architect at Berkshire Design Group, then plotted those GPS points on the original plan with the BVW, uh, excuse, yeah, with the BVW delineation that was used to, uh, for the, when we got the original order of conditions in 2004. So we're using the same original plan and just overlaying the new GPS data on top of it. Kristen, set those, she can speak to what the flags in the field meant because the flags in the field weren't, we didn't go pick up, I, I or nobody I hired uh, went to pick up those data points in the field. They just took the GPS data that Kristen entered while she was delineating the vernal pool and took that raw numerical data and just put it onto a, a plan, you know, integrating it with the GIS and all the other uh, reference data to make sure that it was accurately plotted. That's right. Thanks, Ted. Yep. Yeah. I keep but, going yeah. back to the fact that like a Trimble GPS is is also a very good accuracy, you know, piece of equipment. And I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have Kristen's original point at my fingertips, but depending on the settings of the GPS, it can be pretty close to survey grade accuracy, you know, so I mean, I even save the data output table when I post process the data. We do have a pretty decent antenna. I mean, it yeah, could be as much as let's say twelve inches off. You know, right. I mean, they're very good. We're not; these points are not going to be like three to five feet off, especially not where that property is. Um, so I just want to make that clear. Like, mm -hmm. you know, with the the third party thing, like, yeah, again, like. I just don't know that it's going to change the delineation. If anything, you know, we're following a drought. So if we want to be conservative in protecting the wetland, we're probably pretty close here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So again, I don't disagree with anything you're saying, Jen. I think you and I are yeah. in pretty much the same place. Um, yeah. Again, I mean, I guess just being conservative, I'm leaning towards, yeah, going for third party and having it be, yeah, verified in the field. So I just want to point out, so Leroy um, was new to the board several months into this review. So um, I don't think he can participate in, in a vote. And Laura is an abutter, so she also can't participate in a vote. So in order for this to be approved, it would need to be the um, Brett, Jen, mm -hmm. Anna, and Larry all voting in favor of it. And it seems like the board's pretty split. I just, for what it's worth putting that out there, um, because I feel like we're kind of at an impasse right now. Um, or what do you think about looking at it now? I mean, just, I know that it's not vernal pool season, but what would the benefit of that be? Or would there be any benefit of looking at it now, looking at where the flags are set and viewing it in the field right now in the off season? Well, there there are indicators available any time of year of, of you know, long-term, seasonal ponding. I mean, there's, you know, the extent of water stain leaves on the ground, um, you know, moss trim lines and stains on the tree trunks, all those things indicate, um, you know, ponding into basically into the period where the water warms up enough to cause, you know, um, iron reduction and, you know, depletion of the iron in the leaves and and the you know effects on the, the moss growing on the trunks and things. So yeah, I can I could correlate the flags to those type of indicators right now. Um, you know, again, I just I wouldn't see the actual extent of ponding, which you know can sometimes go go beyond those limits. But if if those if the available indicators now, you know, correlate well with the topography, then you know I I could get a level of comfort from a review now. I can't guarantee that, but, but I could. 
Yeah, and I'm not sure that the board split at this point, Aaron. So I'm not quite sure where that's coming from, but. I do think that that's a really good middle ground though. Even, we could even, you know, restrict the re field review to the, you know, lots in question, you know, and to make it feasible and have some sort of idea of what's going on, you know, maybe by our next meeting. I don't know. I mean, I know these are frequent, so, and everyone's busy, et cetera. Um, yeah. Aaron, but, can you can you remind me how much this contract was for and and how much each part of it was? Yeah, just take me a second to pull it up. And I just wanted to address Brett's comment. I was just I just had in my notes that Anna was in favor of a third party review on site and Larry was in favor of a third party review on site. So that's where I came up with the split because it seemed like uh okay. But then Jen and I were on the to answer your to answer your question, task one was seven eighty and task two was eight thirty dollars. Thank you. And I'm happy to to defer to Jen and Brett's judgment on this. I think it's just in some way I like the idea of of kind of continuing to look at this in, in a little bit of a deeper or a third party way, whether it's like physically in the field or another desk review or however you go about it. I don't think a desk well, is going to get us yeah. I mean, yeah. either they're in the field or nothing. Yeah. So if art were to go out to the the vernal pool and BBW boundaries, kind of that would impact these four lots in question and confirm the locations or, you know, decide if he has a reasonable level of confidence in those locations. Is that what we would be happy with? It somewhat depends on what he finds, because I mean, he could right. go out there and say that he's uncomfortable with indicators that they're not there at all or something along those lines. I don't think he's going to know. And I, the reason I'm asking that is because I'm thinking like, can we add like, if we're uncomfortable with this, is there a way to approximate it? And, you know, I'm just trying to think about how we can anticipate possible outcomes and a way to continue to push the timeline because I just am, you know, cognizant of how long this is taking. Yeah, I mean, we have to do it right. So, I mean, the timeline yeah. isn't, a, I'm not as, personally, I'm not as concerned about the timeline. It's just, I'm always concerned about we get additional information, but it doesn't make any difference. Right, right. So Which is kind of what I'm anticipating. So I'm thinking like, all right, if we're going to end up at the same place anyway, how can we efficiently make ourselves feel the best we possibly can and be the most informed in order to make that decision? Um, yeah, I trust Brett and Jen because of their experience in looking at these things in the process. I look at it from the point of view that maybe is unfair because I want to I want to do the right thing. But I judge I, I agree with your judgment in most cases that I may be missing things. I think we I'll definitely say I'm going to speak for you, Jen, that we all want to do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to put myself in that camp too, please. <laughs> <laughs> so Ted, I I. I Time at this point uh, kind of doesn't have any value to uh, us. The, the winter is coming, um, <laughs> to quote a phrase. And um, I think that if, um, if, if the applicant is being required to spend money to have an expert go out there and evaluate uh, to determine whether or not the previous professional did an accurate job, then why not do that under the best possible conditions, which is in the spring when the, when the water is actually standing there and an accurate determination can be made of the limit of the vernal pool so that everybody is comfortable. We don't have to, art doesn't go out there in the fall, feels uncomfortable, finds indeterminate information, and then we're all back at square one thinking that we should have a fourth party evaluating whether or not, you know, the third party was accurate in their determination. So I would rather just do it right and have everybody and, and dot every I and cross every T and be done with it. Can I just interject? Thank you for saying that, Ted, that's generous of you. Um, I also just want to say, I know that the Amherst Conservation Commission is bound by your bylaw. But to get overly consumed with the 100 foot buffer is a little bit um, ecologically narrow sighted for this kind of ecology. I, you know, I, I just want to put that out there. You know, these, these animals don't follow the 100 foot buffer zone to a T. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. If there's 10 feet off in one vertex, 
I don't know if that's going to make or break a population of vernal pool breeding amphibians. And we're not talking about a 10 foot error with a Trimble GPS unit. We're talking about maybe six inches. I think there might have been a vertex or there'll be more vertices that are added. And so that will get smooth. But It'll uh, smooth it, but. Yeah. Okay, so I do notice that there is somebody from the public. So um, before I let them um, go to them, is there any other pieces from the commission? So if not, I'll go to the public, then come back to us, and then hopefully we can move on. Okay, um, so it's either Becky or Mark. You should be able to speak. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I, I just want to agree with the applicant. I think uh, to make everyone feel comfortable about this is really the goal, and uh, to wait for the spring to get really accurate measurements is the way to go. I, I applaud his, uh, his willingness to do that, and I, I, I see no reason why that shouldn't be the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think ideally we would, I mean, each of these are separate lots, but if we could just deal with this once, I think it'd be a little easier. Um, granted, five is pretty far out there, but, um, um, but I mean, so would that be okay, Ted? I, I, have, I guess I have a question for the scientists. What's the earliest time in the spring that it's reasonable to go out and evaluate the vernal pool uh, um, boundary? Doesn't it depend on the spring? It's weather dependent, but March 12th is a, a kind of the earliest you can get. And, and the sweet spots mid to late April? It depends. <laughs> it I depends. mean, it has to okay. be after the animals have migrated and deposited egg masses to, you know, get an optimal count. Well, that's, do it that, as late that, as June. That's to determine the count of the, of the breeding population. I'm questioning when's the optimal time to evaluate the border of the, of the standing water. Art, if you agree, right after snow melt? Um, depends on the snowpack and the amount of rain early in the early in the spring. But yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen very dry conditions in March, and then and then the rain come in April into May. So we just have to keep. I mean, as long as as long as we have a normal snowpack and normal precipitation in April, I'd be comfortable going out there you know, as early as, as I'm, I'm sorry, as early. Um, so normal snowpack and normal rain in March, I'd be comfortable going out there middle to late March at the earliest. But that's not very precise, Ted, but I think that's as accurate as you're going to be able to get. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just, I was just curious. I thought all of us should know. Yeah. Right. I agree. Yeah. So uh, it feels like Jen, it's kind of, you and I going back and forth and yeah I mean to be on the conservative side might as well go for the third party it's not yeah it's I not mean if we have Ted and our public constituents agreeing <laughs> no. and we feel that's like right. it it will protect the resource to the greatest degree then it seems right. like that's the right thing to do here I agree yeah I, it could actually go we don't know which direction it's going to go yeah but that's always a that's bit of a very crime. possible I mean there's very little soil moisture, very little water stored in the watersheds right now. So it, it totally depends on the winter. Yeah. When the thaw happens. How much snow we get, when the thaw yeah, happens, yeah. what those temps look like. There's no such thing as normal. Yeah. So, okay. So, I mean, we do need to, we can't, you know, wait multiple years either. So, I think what we have as a path forward is what I'm hearing is consensus um, on moving forward with third party review in the field in earliest possible conditions. So be that mid-March, that's great. If it's later, then so be it. Um, we so already we, have a contract uh, in place, and so I think we're good. Are we continuing until first meeting in March? Uh, what, well, what we, what, earliest what? would be mid-March. So that would be sometime in April would be the earliest potential for us to. So the first so, Conservation Commission meeting in April is April 14th. The last one in March is March 24th. I, I guess the question is, who's going to determine when the time to do the field work is? Is we just going to leave it up to the scientists to make that determination and then report? The yep. weather and the scientists. 
Yep. So I'm, I'm very comfortable leaving that up to, yeah, the experts. So that would be okay. That'd be art in this case. I mean, there's multiple experts here, obviously, but as our independent third party reviewer. So, so is that enough clear direction for you, Art? Aaron, is there more? I know we have to make a motion and do that sort of stuff, but. That's fine with me. I'll put it on my calendar for to start monitoring, uh, you know, conditions in early March. And I, I monitor precipitation across the state anyway. So I'll be in touch with Aaron and I'll, I'll schedule it up, uh, you know, as soon as I can in the spring. Yep. And so we do have the contract already in place. So we're good on that side. Great. Uh, that was good forethought. So thank you on that, Aaron. And I would like to be part of the uh, field uh, visits if you're going to make them art so I can just see what you're doing. I'm curious to, to learn. Through the board, that's fine with me. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have a path moving forward. One thing we didn't discuss yet, Ted, was one and two. Should we just delay one and two until the same time? If we're going to continue them, let's just continue all of them. Okay. So that'll make everything uh, a little bit cleaner, I think. So we're looking for a motion on one, two, five, six, seven, and eight uh, Concord Way. Um, are there any other, I mean, just a continuation. So I guess there's no conditions or anything, so. I would just say we should pick a date and time certain. Um, I would say maybe April 28th at 7.30. That would just give us the end of March, early April to see what conditions look like and get a report if possible. Um, but I mean, if he's able to do it earlier. Um, we could also do the 14th. That's fine. So April 14th. I mean, does that sound like a reasonable time frame for you, Art? I, I grant, granted it's all weather dependent, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I can certainly make it work as long as the conditions cooperate. Yeah. Okay, so April 14th and we're looking for, so I assume 730? Mm-hmm. Okay, I move that we continue um, the notice of intent for Tofino Associates for construction of single family houses with associated driveways, utilities, and landscaping within buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands at lots one, two, five, six, seven, and eight Concord Way in Amherst, Mass to the Conservation Commission meeting on April 14th at um, 7.30 p.m. Second. Anything in there about um, exercising the second option for our contract? You or want that, me to? So you want me to add that this yeah. continuation is in order to accommodate uh, the field portion of a third-party review of the um, vernal pool delineation um, adjacent to previously listed lots. Okay. Good job. Second. Okay. So vote. So Jen. Aye. Larry? Aye. Anna? Aye. Aye for me, Leroy? Abstain. And Laura? Abstain. Yep. I knew they had to, but just to kind of get it formally. Okay. So, Art, thank you very much. Um, so, we'll be seeing you again. You'll probably be here before we know it. So, um, hopefully, we have good weather and we can do it earlier. So, Ted, thanks for um, you know sticking with oh, this. And thank you all for for persevering this. I know this has been a very tortuous project, and I, I appreciate your your uh, perseverance and your willingness to think things through. And um, for those people in the public, again, thank you for keeping on this. Thank you for speaking up. Um, yeah, we're always trying to do what's right. It's not always clear what's right, but I mean that is definitely what we are always trying to do. Um, so. You know, mark your calendars for April 14th. There is not going to be another notification for you for that. Um, you know, if that time is coming close and you're interested if we're going to be able to do this or not, please get in touch with Aaron. Um, and that's about the most we can sort of provide. So, okay. So thank you, Ted. Thank you, Kristen. Thank yeah. you, Art. All right. Night now. Thank you, guys. Okay, so so just switching up. Okay, um, so we are good there. Okay, so 
one down. Okay, so moving on to our 745. This is a notice of intent. And so, um, and so if you are here for the 745 notice intent, this is Conservation Works Kestrel Trust. If you can raise your hand. Um, oh, yep. Yeah, that's right. So, oh, it says we'll be rejoining. So, okay, Pete, so you should be on there. And so let me just formally open this up. Oh, my computer just froze. Okay, there we go. Uh, this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, an act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended in the Town of Amherst Wetlands Protection Bylaw. Again, this is a notice of intent um, that's being filed by the Conservation Works and Kestrel Trust for the installation of 400 linear feet of two foot wide blog, bog bridging on existing trails and farm roads on Food Bank Trail on Town of Amherst Potter Conservation Area and Catherine Cole. And so Pete, um, if you wanna just introduce yourselves, uh, uh, introduce yourself. And so obviously you have a, a strong background here, let's say, um, and provide a little um, background on the project. That'd be great. Sure, thanks, Brett. Everybody still awake? Can you hear, can you hear me okay? <laughs> We can hear you, and we're just getting going, Pete. So we've been waiting. For you. Okay. okay. Well, I'll tr I'll try to drag this out then. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, the, so the project, uh, if you've seen the maps, and I think Aaron can put our our map up of the project. What we're doing. I'm sorry, Pete. But can you can you just introduce yourself? Most of us know you, but maybe not everyone here. Yeah, does. I was leaning into that. Uh, my gotcha. my seven person firm is called Conservation Works. And we, we do a lot of work all over New England, but uh, recently, well, over the years, quite a few projects for both uh, Amherst College and Kestrel Land Trust. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm well familiar with the bridge situation that uh, Aaron was talking about earlier, the emergency certification. That, that's the situation that the bridge uh, is actually at the very south end of the small pond back in the woods east of the railroad and a big tree fell on it and it's leaning sharply to one side so it's 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 definitely in need of a, a quick fix yep. but uh the the current plan uh which which kestrel is sponsoring uh and we've been we've been working with uh with closely with dave zomek on the plans uh, is really to complete the loop that you see in the picture. So starting over at the right side uh, near 116, where the Valley Light Opera Barn is, the, uh, the trail goes uh, south and then west and then into Hadley. So it's a two-town project and we're following with the town of Hadley too. Uh, we had originally anticipated that we would be asking permission to put some bog bridging on the farm road through the northern Podic area uh, where Aaron has the marker, uh, which has been subject to the beaver flooding that you've already talked about tonight. And uh, it, it looks as though Eversource is going to make every effort to alleviate the flooding so that that's not part of the plan now. We've taken that out which leaves us with a total of a proposed 240 feet of bog bridging uh, in, the, in the south end of the property, or really it's on the other, it's on the Catherine Cole parcel uh, in four different spots. And if, if that's enough of the map, Aaron, you could move on and I can show you what the terrain looks like. What we're really talking about is an existing trail that's been there on an old farm road for a long time. And it's, it's well compacted. It's, um, it's uh, not really got wetland vegetation, although the Mass DEP GIS wetland layer shows most of that area being BBW, which is fine. We're, we're, we're acknowledging that. Uh, on the right of the picture, you see an example of exactly what we're proposing to build. It's, it's inexpensive enough to uh, be within Kestrel's budget, and it's, uh, the plan is to put it on 
the trail that has already been severely compacted. Uh, so the subsequent pictures will show you what the terrain looks like now. There are, there are a lot of wet spots along it. They're not severe, they're not deep. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. So this is the first site, uh, the westernmost site, and you can see what's happened. It, it's dry here in the picture because we've had a dry year, but uh, and we walked it today, and it's it's this one is still fairly dry. But in, in an average year, it's going to be wet enough so that people who are walking have to divert around the wet spots, and the trail keeps getting wider, and there's more and more damage to the ground. So the idea is to focus people on this less than two foot wide um, walking surface, which is easy to put in. Uh, we put the uh, two foot long sleepers that are four by sixes with a four foot, four inch, with a four inch dimension on the ground. Uh, this is pressure treated material. And then uh, on top of that, uh, anchor in planks, uh, the, the sleepers are, are spaced four feet apart and are anchored in with rebar. So it's, it's your typical bog bridge. And uh, it's, um, it's we, we think it's appropriate for this kind of setting where the ground's already well compacted, there's no wetland vegetation where the, where the bridge is going. So Aaron, can you want to advance to the next yeah, here's, here's site number two. So as you go along, and you can see people have, over the years, I don't, I don't know whether this was put in by the town or um, well-meaning uh, walkers, but uh, there, there are logs, there are boards here and there because people have felt appropriate to put in something mm -hmm. so that they don't get uh, up to their ankles every year. So then if you move on, uh, we are also looking at the 40-foot bridge that's been in there for a long time. It's, it's on poles, 40-foot poles, and it doesn't need any work at all other than the replacement of a good many of the, uh, the uh, tread uh, planks, which I think are two feet long. These are not three feet. So we'll do, we'll do that without any impact to the wetland. And then uh, site four is a similar area of wetness. And then uh, just beyond this site, you have the Hadley town line. And from then on, it's Hadley's um, issue to deal with. So we'll be in front of them at, the, at their next hearing. And then uh, uh, I think the next picture, yeah, this, this is what we've taken out. There's an old farm road that goes to the back fields at Podick. And we had thought some bog bridging there would be good because the beavers have made it hard to walk across, but I hope Eversource is effective in taking care of that issue. So we'll keep an eye on it. And I don't think of anything else to mention. Oh yes, we, we did go to Natural Heritage uh, to ask, we paid the fee and, and requested the species identification because it is in a um, uh, Biomap 2 uh, core habitat area. And they got back to us and said that it's climbing fern or Hartford fern. And uh, we've, we've scoured that area. That is, I, I'm well familiar with that species. Uh, there's a lot of it in the south end of Lawrence Swamp. And I haven't seen it yet and we'll be on the lookout for it. But I, I don't see any way that we, our work would impact that particular species here. And their, their identification was for both Hadley and Amherst part of the project. So if it's possible, we might be able to start construction in the fall, although I don't think Hadley's going to move fast enough to permit what, what we want to do on their side. So there's every likelihood that we'll delay until spring. So are there questions? Great. Thank you, Pete. So Aaron, do you have uh, anything to present? And then I think there was also some comments from DEP on this one, if I remember correctly. 
Then, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. If I could just add that, that at, at one point, Janice Stone from Hadley uh, went onto the property, but she went onto the wrong property and ended up at the north end of Podick taking pictures of the beaver flooding. And, uh, and on, on the basis of seeing that picture, which she sent to Mark uh, Stinson, uh, he uh, <laughs> came back with some, some strong language, uh, not necessarily in favor of the project, but uh, I think because we are, are really looking at that, that south trail and okay. land that's already been severely disturbed, uh, I, I think Mark will take a different view. That's yeah, helpful because it didn't seem, that wording was very strong. I was kind of surprised. So I'm sorry, Aaron. Yeah, I did, I did um, clarify that with Mark, that issue, um, and let him know that that 160 feet, um, we were aware that that was flooded and that we were working on getting the beavers out of there and that that, that section of bog bridging was going to be removed from this proposal, which um, Pete, Pete did amend the plan and resend it today. Um, from walking the site, my observation is that the compaction in the farm road, the old, the former farm road, which is now a trail, the compaction is such that really the trail is, is an upland path in the middle of the wetland. There was one, and we had a huge rainstorm, obviously, um, the night before, and there was only one small area which um, had a, a puddle in the middle of it. Other than that, there was no indicators of hydrology on the path and it was, um, most of it was not vegetated. It was just a compacted dirt path. So um, I don't really have any issues with the placement of the bog bridging and I certainly don't think that there's anything needed in the way of replication because I don't think that the placement of this bog bridge is going to be filling any wetland because I don't think that the path itself is wetland. Um, the only comments I really have are just that we need the abutter notices and the certified abutters list which you may have scanned to me Pete but I don't have in hard copy form so uh, I just um, had that in my notes from today and then um, we need the DEP file number to make an approval and then any comments from Natural Heritage which since this is not estimated habitat I'm sh I don't think we need an, an official approval from Natural Heritage um, but just general comments. Okay that's fine I'll get you the extra material and we'll wait for the file number. Great. But I mean, the board can't take any action on it tonight because we don't have a DEP file number on the project. So um, my recommendation would be that we just wait for DEP to submit a file number to us. And, um, and then at that point, the board could take action to approve or. So am I right that you'll continue till November 18? I would recommend that we continue to October 28th because I think that we could get it taken care of at that meeting. Oh, good, good, good. That's much better. Thank you. Yep. And even before um, we do a continuation, might as well open it up for comments at this point while it's fresh in our minds because then hopefully at the 18th, then you can show up if you want, Pete, but depending on how things go today and what's in the DEP, you can come or not. Sure. Thanks. I'll check in with Aaron beforehand. Um, so, commissioners, I mean, so this seems like a fairly straightforward thing. It seems like an improvement out there. Um, I mean, so Pete, are you going to do anything to close down those trails that are getting wider at all? Are you going to reseed those or put up brush piles or just kind of let nature and the hikers take well, their Well, I, I think they will uh, seed in by themselves. There's, there's a constant rain of seeds in that area. So I'd be surprised if it didn't green up pretty quickly. But uh, if, if, you, yeah. if you like, we can do something about it. But I, I think we'll be OK. More out of curiosity. So. Yeah. Commissioners have any other questions? Or uh, is there anybody from the public? If you do, you can just raise your hand. Okay, um, so it seems pretty straightforward. I assume, assuming nothing interesting comes out um, from any of the additional letters, we should be good to go on the 18th. And so what's the time for that one, Erin? Um, 7.40 on October 28th. Oh, 28th, I'm sorry. 
Okay, so looking for a motion for continuation for October 28th at 7.40. Oh God, I just had it now. Oh, moved. Oh, moved. You're not gonna say the whole thing, Larry? No, I think so moved is much. When, you, when you're recording a, me a meeting like this, it's really nice because everything is recorded ahead of time. So you know when you say so moved. I've been in meetings like this where the, where the secretary goes crazy because they don't know what's been said, but here we know what's been said. That's just me. I'm just. <laughs> and by the way, I just had a distraction. I got up and walked away because I had two bear on my deck. And this is a conservation commission, so they're good. Si they're good sized cubs. They were sitting on my deck, and I just I was out there. I was out there shining the flashlight at them as they ran across the yard. <laughs> cool. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so Larry. Aye. Anna. Aye. Ben. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I, for me as well. So um, we'll be in touch, Pete. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, so now we are back on to our request for determination. And so let me officially open this up. Um, so if you are here for that, if you can raise your hand. Um, so what Rebecca, okay. Um, okay, this public meeting is now called to order. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended and the Town of Amherst Wetlands Protection Bylaw. This is a request for determination uh, being presented by SWCA on behalf of Eversource for a concurrent slash after the fact emergency filing for the installation of 1,500 linear feet of duct system, including seven manholes within the roadway layout and shoulder of Route 116. And so, um, and so who do we have? And so, uh, Rebecca, if you would like to um, present where we're at at this point, and then we can move on from there. And please uh, introduce yourself as well. Absolutely. Uh, Becky Weissman, I'm a natural resources team lead with SWCA Environmental. Um, and would it be okay if I shared my screen? That would be great. All right. Yep. Uh, you can see all your right. Screen. Everyone can see. Okay, great. Um, so uh, this is the project that was the subject of the emergency authorization that you ratified earlier today. Uh, or earlier at, at, on today's call. Um, as noted during that, it is a duck line that is proposed at um, about 3,600 linear feet that will go from the Podic substation north to um, Plum Tree Road in Sunderland. Um, the work is proposed entirely within the roadway layout of Route 116, um, either the paved roadway or the immediate adjacent roadway, uh, maintained roadway shoulder. Oh. Um, and just to show you kind of more detailed, you'll see here show, this shows the line um, in this red dash line is the proposed line. Um, and these dots with the M are the proposed manholes. Um, within uh, Amherst, there will be um, about 1,500 linear feet of duck line in Amherst, and three of the manholes are in Amherst. Um, SWCA did delineate wetlands along the proposed route, um, and you'll see in green are the delineated wetlands, in the lighter green, in the darker green are the uh, DEP um, GIS data layer wetlands. Um, the green dashed line is 100 foot buffer zone. Um, this blue line here uh, represents a floodplain, um, th this blue with the little hatching on it. 
And then there is riverfront area is this blue dashed line here. So the work um, is going to be, the duck line is going to be constructed by uh, conventional open trenching. Um, it'll be a three foot wide trench that'll be five feet deep. Um, work is proposed uh, within the 100 foot buffer zone and 200 foot riverfront area. And in addition, there's about 360 linear feet that's within uh, bordering land subject to flooding. Um, no uh, permanent impacts are proposed. Um, the majority of the work is uh, exempt from the Wetlands Protection Act as um, uh, utility work within um, minor, it's a minor exempt activity for work within buffer zone or riverfront area. The exception is that 360 linear feet that's within bordering land subject to flooding. Um, but that work will not impact grades at all. That's, you know, it's a below ground uh, pipeline. There is one manhole that's proposed within uh, the BLSF, um, but again, it's it's going to be constructed flush at grade, so there's going to be no impact to compensatory flood storage or any of those um, uh, impacts to performance standards of the bordering land subject to flooding. Um, work uh, was originally expected to kick off in early October, which was the reason for the uh, request for the emergency certification. Um, as Aaron had mentioned, um, this is due to uh, uh, outages that are being experienced by customers on a pretty frequent basis. So it's, it's um, been deemed to be emergent work by Eversource. Um, and uh, so originally, like I said, work was supposed to start off in early October. Right now, the plan is it's been pushed off a little bit to October. They're, they're anticipating October 19th or 20th. They finally secured contracts with the, with the contractor to do the work. Um, that was kind of the delay. Um, they also had to go out and uh, pre-characterize soils along the route. Um, it's not expected that all of the soils that are removed during trenching will be able to be reused within the um, as, as backfill within the trench. So they had to do some pre-characterization so that they can identify an appropriate facility to dispose of those soils. Um, we are proposing uh, obviously erosion and sedimentation controls. Those are shown on the plans. Um, just to show you, this is the, the part that goes from the Podic substation. You, the yellow lines are a little bit faint, probably on your computer screen, but that it, those are the locations where we are proposing um, erosion controls. And this, this is the town line here with uh, Sunderland. Um, so we're proposing erosion and sedimentation controls, you know, consisting of straw wattles, uh, as a barrier as well as um, catch basin inlet protection along the stretch of roadway. Um, we'll also have a uh, environmental compliance monitor um, on a bi-weekly basis who will be um, monitoring the construction and ensuring that erosion sedimentation controls are installed and, and being properly man maintained. We um, will be doing uh, contractor training prior to construction to make sure that the contractors are aware of uh, their responsibilities for um, during this time. Um, sorry. Uh, and the, um, we'll also be out there during the removal of soils to ensure proper, um, we'll have another, an LSP that'll be out there uh, during soil removal to ensure that the, the soils are being uh, disposed of properly as well. And I will open it to any questions. So thank you very much, Becky. So Aaron, do you have anything that you'd like to add at this point? Um, I have no problem with the proposed work. Um, I, you know, as long as it conforms to the plans and um, all of the conditions that were outlined by Becky in her presentation, as far as erosion and sediment controls, protection for inlets, um, you know, regular monitoring during construction to ensure that uh, material is not migrating. So my recommendation um, would be 
um, a motion for approval, a positive determination checking box B5 to um, assert um, uh, jurisdiction under our local bylaw and then a negative determination checking boxes B2 and B3 for Wetland Protection Act and um, utilizing the conditions that I had referenced in the emergency certification. Okay, so commissioners, any comments, questions for Becky? I mean, so uh, one point of clarification for me, Becky, um, can you just reiterate where the work is going to be done? So you said some of it's going to be either in the roadway or it's directly adjacent to the roadway. So is there any natural vegetation that's being taken out? Um, the vegetation is all, I was actually on the site today. I can show you some um, pictures. Let me see. But it's, it's pretty heavily mowed along the roadway shoulder. All of the work is proposed um, within the roadway layout. Okay. And it's only a three foot wide trench. So um, let's see if I can make sure that, hold on. There we go. Okay. So kind of this is this is pretty typical here of the maintained roadway shoulder. Right. Oh, we cannot see your screen. You can't see my screen any longer? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yep, now we can. Okay, great. All right. So this is pretty typical of um, the what's along the roadway. As you can see, it's a pretty well maintained area. Um, this uh, they have staked out there the limits of the the roadway layout um, and the work will be entirely within the limits of the roadway layout. Um, this is one of the wetlands. I think this is wetland B. And this is facing east um, from from uh, wetland E, I guess. I can show you if you need to, like kind of wetland E is like just this swale here. Um, so the, it's, as you can see, it's a pretty well maintained roadway shoulder. Okay. Yep. So that's helpful to me. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, other commissioners, you have any comments or questions? So is there anybody from the public who has any comments or questions? You can just use the little feature to raise your hand. Okay, so not seeing any. Um, so if I'm not hearing anything, then looking for a motion on this. And so Aaron, can you, you put back up your slides, please? If anybody needs a cheat sheet like I do. All right, I'll take it. Um, I'm recommending a motion for approval, a positive, de positive determination checking box B5 bylaw, negative determination checking box B2 and B3 of the Wetlands Protection Act with conditions referenced in the emergency certification. Thank you, Laura. Looking for a second. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Leroy. Okay, so uh, voice vote, Laura? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Larry? Aye. Anna? Aye. Jen? Aye. And I from me as well. So thank you very much, Becky, and Aaron will be in touch with the paperwork. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Okay, so just change. Oh, okay, so I think we are good there. Okay, um, so Aaron, is there a certain order that we want to hit the additional pieces that are on our list? I think we've hit all of the other business items that I wanted to cover. I think the last one that we were going to discuss tonight was 214 Pomeroy. Okay. And so. That. I see that Sabina's here. So Sabina, I will promote you to uh, panelist.
Uh, and I'm not sure if there's anybody else here with you for this one. Okay. Um, so Aaron, can you just provide a quick recap on where we're at with this one? And I think we're up to a enforcement order, if I remember correctly. Yes. So um, after the last meeting, um, we had scheduled um, a couple site walks. One was with um, Tom Reedy and Andy Bone and uh, myself, Anna and um, Larry made it out to that site walk. Um, and as part of that initial site walk, um, I had ratified the initial enforcement order that was issued in order to include include estimates in the amount of resource areas that were altered and um, those areas Anna and I had had walked and sort of paced off and and taken sort of some measurements um, approximate in the field and then I took those notes um, that I had taken from our field measurements and inputted them into GIS in order to come up with approximate um, you know, estimations of, of alteration to include in the enforcement order. And enforcement orders do require us to estimate the amount of alteration. Um, it's actually a, a section within the enforcement order where we have to do that because um, it just tells DEP basically how much area was altered um, as part of the order. So that's what that contained. And then the second part of that was just my recommendation recommendations as staff for sort of how to proceed forward with um, as far as the the um, restoration and my recommendation was to require a notice of intent be filed for the um, restoration and the reason for that is is sort of twofold one is because um, we can condition to have access to the site in order to monitor it while work is going on just to make sure that there's nothing going on on site that is um, you know not part of the order of conditions and also um, because we can make sure that it's recorded on the lot and um, require after the fact that there be a certificate of compliance to ensure that all of the work is completed to the commission satisfaction. So um, that is the basically the um, the recommendations that I made and I also had recommended that we um, require an actual wetland scientist to put the replication plan together or the restoration plan together um, because I think there was so much square footage of of wetlands that were altered as part of this project that having somebody who who understands the science of wetlands and and plants and and the communities out there would be really important um, just to touch on a couple things um, i was contacted by um, andy bone had let me know that he may or may not be participating in the future on this but there was a, a wetland scientist who submitted a a resume. Um, formerly, she worked with SWCA, and she's a, a professional wetland scientist. So um, she had she had reached out to me, and also Sabina had provided her resume to us as well. So we can take a look at that. I also was able to locate site visit photos from mid December and early January, which I uploaded to our um, OneDrive folder for members to view, and. Um, I also, uh, Sabina um, in the last few days had provided a, um, a correspondence to us um, with kind of what her plan was moving forward. And one of the things that um, kind of jumped out at me was some language about farming activities on the property. And so I just wanted to, I did a little research myself on when the site was last farmed or hayed. And um, I was able to um, find some aerial imagery that basically shows that the property was last um, mowed in 2005. So that was about 15 years ago. Um, other aerial imagery that I was able to find shows that the property was growing in with vegetation since then, since 2005. So just wanted to make sure that it was clear that there was no 
agricultural activities that were going on there and the land, the land was fallow for over five years. And that was basically, that was all I have. I, I have the document from Sabina, which I had forwarded to you guys already. Um, but it's kind of a, a quick, quick update. Okay, thank you. And also just to add that and a thank you to Sabina and Meredith. Um, and so they allowed access and so they accompanied myself and Leroy, I think it was Saturday. Um, so we were able to get out there as well and see the property. So that was very helpful. Um, okay, so Sabina, do you have anything that you would like to add before we start to deliberate? I guess what I'd like to accomplish today is um, the review of um, <clears throat> Meredith's resume, uh, because in my uh, the letter from Aaron, it, it's specified that the board should okay the wetland scientists that we use to uh, restore the wetlands. I think that's about all. Um, I have in my mind to, to be able to ask you all to do tonight. Okay, great. And then, um, Aaron, what happens between the ratification enforcement order and the NOI? Is no work allowed until the NOI is fully in place? I just want to make sure that that's clear. Yeah, so the cease and desist remains in place until there's an approved order of conditions on the site for the restoration. So, okay, so until the NOI is in place and approved, then. I mean, I'm not referring to like planning work, like if there was, you know, work to go out and set flags or, you know, investigation as far as, you know, the best approach to, to restoration work, that can take place. It's more like, um, you know, any type of, con you know, con construction, earthwork, cutting, things like that couldn't happen. Um, mm -hmm without a permit. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, so I think that this all sounds like a, a good path forward. So basically we would be, yeah, making sure everything is ratified appropriately. And then it will be up to um, the applicant, to the landowner and her um, wetland specialist to move forward. And, yep, we will definitely, we can definitely talk about Meredith. I've seen her background and seems very legitimate to me. But, um, we'll see what other people have to say. So do any other commissioners have thoughts on where we're at? Um, questions on moving forward? You know, I just want to thank the other commissioners from going, for going out and doing that uh, site visit. I was not able to and disappointed. So thanks everyone for doing that. Yeah, I second that. Thanks guys. Well, luckily when Leroy and I went out there, Sabina made it a beautiful day for us. So it was, it was a pleasure. <laughs> and it sounds like Aaron and Anna, you guys did some serious little mapping. So thank you. Lots of pacing involved. Yeah. <laughs> nice work. <laughs> I, I just got to look at it because my knee doesn't let me do this. By the way, I have an appointment to see a surgeon about my knee. Oh, good for you. So. Okay. Um, so I'm not really hearing any problems with this as a plan for moving forward or any sort of questions. So I think that most of that will come when, you know, when the NOI is in front of us. Um, Aaron, can you, do you have any opinions on Meredith as a applicable um, person? I mean, she has been an agent for at least a couple of towns. She is, uh, I don't know if certified is the right word, but she's a professional wetland scientist and she yep. seems to have all the right credentials from what I can tell. Yeah. I mean, I, I would have no problem with her working on the, on the restoration. She seems like a um, fully qualified and competent professional. Yeah, and she's worked with Emily, I can't remember her last name, but um, somebody who's done some other work with us. And yeah, just being out in the field with Meredith, it seemed, yeah, everything seemed right. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, so not hearing anything else, uh, Aaron, can you help us paperwork wise? So what are, what do we need to do at this point? So I would need a motion to ratify the enforcement order that was issued. Um, is there specific That's, language like which 
Um, so it's the enforce the revised enforcement order that was issued on 9 16 20. That's the only thing that I would like to postpone because in that enforcement order, there are square footages that I'd like to have measured by the surveyor. So um, I, I would just counter that in enforcement orders, typically it's not, um, you know, the, the, the numbers aren't typically provided by the person committed who committed or the the owner of the property where the violation took place that are being provided in there. Um, what I would suggest is that if in the notice of intent application, um, you know, more exact measurements are taken that those be presented at that time. These are merely estimates that were taken by us in the field to get a general sense of the amount of alteration that was done. And that's very standard for enforcement orders. And it's it's required by DEP that we include those in enforcement orders. Oh, I wish Meredith were here because she told me that it's typically the, um, the owner um, who provides the, the square footage. And I do want that to be accurate. Yeah, these are just estimates at this point. I mean, it's not going to really impact everything, anything going forward, Sabina. Because um, yeah, you'll come up with better estimates or Meredith will for moving forward. This is just to kind of push all the paperwork forward is all. Um, all right, if we have a, a, a verbal understanding that this is not the final square footage, I have no problem with that. Oh, even more, yeah, it's, we have it in writing and yeah. Yeah, this is definitely not the, these are just approximations is all they are. Okay. So 100%. Okay, so um, if I'm not here, not hearing anything else, then looking for a motion for ratification. <laughs> so moved. Looking for a second. Second. Back. Sorry. Second. Thank you. Okay, so voice vote. Leroy? Aye. Anna? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I for me as well. Okay, so we're all set with the, um, with the enforcement order at this point, Sabina. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very clear that we're all comfortable with Meredith, so that is great. Um, She's done NOIs plenty, but if you or her have any questions at all about it, uh, please get in touch with Erin and mm -hmm. she can help walk you through. And as soon as that gets submitted, then we'll be able to get you on a future agenda. Yeah. Do you have That's any questions? Okay. Good. Okay. Good. I think we are good. So thank you, Sabina. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Okay, so Aaron, uh, is there more or are we looking for our favorite motion? Your favorite motion. Hey, I would like to make an addendum on my visitors. There are four bears here. Three cubs that stand about four <laughs> feet tall and a mother that is really big. Wow. Wow, that's cool. Amazing. They, they, they've been on my deck. I was, you know, they're four feet away from me. Fortunately, they haven't come back. My neighbor just had a screen ripped out by the mother, probably. Can you send us a picture, Larry, please? It's all a little confusing, Larry, because to us, it looks like you're in Seinfeld's apartment. So I think I am, all those I am, four bears I am, I am, are doing in your <laughs> well, I, I will, I just, okay, I will send it to you because I just, I, I actually have a video camera out front and I've got videos of these guys right now. So I just sent it to my family. So I'll, after this is over, I'll forward it to you people. Awesome. Right outside downtown Amherst, and we have the same. Well, we have triplets coming through too. I don't know if they're the same ones, but yeah. Oh, I, didn't think, I didn't think we had triplets down. I thought we had. They've been here at my house before, and I thought there was only two cubs. But you know, now I saw it, one of them was up at a tree. So there's three cubs here yeah. today. <laughs> anyway, okay. great fun. It's good old Amherst. And by the way, my my neighbor also has his claims that she's seen a. A, uh, a mountain lion cougar near here, and I believe that because they're down here. I've seen them myself in Amherst. A real, you know, mountain lion type animal that runs around, they're here. That's exciting. <laughs> so, 
Okay, so looking for a motion um, for adjournment. I move we adjourn. <laughs> Second. Okay, Anna? Aye. Leroy? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. And I for me as well. So we are officially closed. So thank you, everyone. Um, Enjoy. Keep safe. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Yes. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you.